Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Joseph Trevisani from Worldwide Markets. Today, um, we're going to look at something we do periodically, every couple of months. Um, I think the most interesting thing about China, now there are many things interesting about China, um, is the degree of scrutiny it requires to keep up with what's going on in China. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this. But the primary one is because China is not an open country, essentially, as far as its economics go, as far as its reporting go. And so you have to dig a bit deeper than you would in the United States or in Europe or Japan or many other countries to see what's going on. For me, the most interesting aspect of Western let's say, non-Chinese approach to China. It's twofold. One, China's government's ability to manage its economy. Out of Beijing, of course, it's a centralized government, is given far more credit than the similar type of management, economic management um, in Europe, or in the United States. We, in the, way, in the United States, are not surprised terribly when the Fed gets things wrong. When the Fed, uh, in 2007, I believe, Mr. Bernanke, said that the subprime loan crisis was contained and it wasn't really going to cause any widespread disruption in the American economy, or the world economy, for that matter. We're not surprised. When the Fed changes its economic projections, always on the one side, the Fed is always downgrading or reducing its economic projections. There's an institutional bias there. The Fed's responsibility is, one of them is for economic growth, and although well, I don't say that specifically, specifically it's inflation and unemployment, but you don't get unemployment or employment. You don't get employment until you get growth. So we're not surprised when the Fed makes a mistake. We're not surprised when the ECB in the summer of 2008 raises rates, when the ECB says that there isn't going to be any European effect from the U.S. subprime crisis. I mean, on and on and on. We're not surprised about that. Yet, when you look at Chinese statistics, when you look at what the the government in Beijing is saying, Western analysts are, seem to be, not all of them, of course, but many of them, certainly the corporate types, confident that China can manage what's going on, that China can manage its economy. They give far more credit in ability to the government in Beijing than they give to their own governments. Part of that is quite understandable. In the United States, in Europe, in Japan, the government is questioned routinely as part of the political process, as part of the political system. The government's claims are routinely checked and the and they're subject to verification by the market, by various markets, by all sorts of non governmental sources. You don't get that nearly to the same degree in China. It's funny, the one, of the, one of the few um, external or non-government statistics is uh, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation PMI indices. But uh, you can't get them in historical basis unless you actually subscribe to Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation's fees and pay for them. So you can't find them on the Bloomberg terminal that I use habitually. Okay, all, by the way, all of the information that you're seeing, the charts are all courtesy of Bloomberg. 
And as always, if anyone has any questions, comments, considerations, or things they'd like to add, please type them into chat um, so everyone can see them, and I will answer all questions as I go. As I always say, I much prefer that this be a colloquium rather than a lecture. Uh, I'm going to look at some of those things, actually, as you say there. I'm going to look at some of the uh, related figures, shall we say, rather than specific Chinese figures. So a little bit more an introduction, and then we will go on. So it is, it is interesting that the Chinese government and its competence is protected, enhanced, shall we say, to a very large degree, by its very lack of transparency. And by the assumption, and this is kind of like an age-old assumption that goes back not just to the founding of the current Chinese state or Chinese government, but one which you could say goes and is in completely in the tradition of the Chinese imperial civil service-based in Beijing. And the Chinese imperial system lasted, well, it was finished in 1921, I believe, and it goes back at least 2,000 years in various forms, and probably more than that. Um, the inheritance is very much the inheritance of the Chinese supposed communists that run the country. It is far easier and I think far more instructive to look at the current government in Beijing, certainly since the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, uh, that's for a generation now, a little bit more, as the direct continuance of the imperial Chinese system that is the historical mode of government governance in China. So Western observers tend to give the Chinese government far more credit and far more ability to manage its economy than they would give to their own governments in whatever country they come from. Part of that, as I said, is the difficulty of getting extra or in additional information from China, aside from what the government tells you. Part of it is that it's simply easier, because if you start assuming the worst or a serious fall in China, you will create all sorts of difficulties for your analysis, if you're doing economic analysis, because nobody really knows how that would work out. But you could say the same thing for the financial crisis in the West. Nobody quite knew how that would work out. Certainly, at the time, no one knew. And I think there's one final reason that um, Western observers, foreign observers, I would say, but not just Western, um, tend to give the Chinese government more credit than they would their own governments. And that is that the Chinese government... has a more powerful motivation than perhaps Western governments do. The United States is a stable society. It would take a great deal of economic dislocation to bring people into the streets. I'm not saying it would happen, but it's not something that we assume in an ordinary course of economic life including recessions, and including even depressions. If you go back to the 1930s, there was very little violent economic unrest of the kind aimed at questioning the legitimacy of the government in the United States. I think that's largely true in Europe as well during the Depression. In China... Its legitimacy, the government's legitimacy, is very closely tied to 
its ability to deliver economic growth and wealth to its people. It doesn't have a great deal of legitimacy beyond that. And so the government has, to put it another way, revolution is always a lot closer to the surface and unrest, civil unrest, is closer to the surface in China than it is here. Sort of the, his, the historical situation in China is that rebellions and revolts in the provinces overthrow the dynasties, and then a new dynasty is formed. So the Chinese government has a motivation to maintain growth almost at all costs as a method of retaining power. As an example, or as a contrast, if the United States suffered a two-year recession, I don't think, I could be wrong, although I do live here, I don't think that the government would be in danger of being overthrown. The ruling party, whoever it is, would be voted out of office the first chance everybody got, most likely. But the political system would, would remain and would remain stable. There's a certain question about whether that's true in China. So for these reasons, observers of China, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, have a tendency to think and a tendency to assume, for their own analysis, of course, if for nothing else, that the Chinese government will get it right. They'll figure it out. There's not going to be a crash, and they will manage the transition. Now, on the side of both the Chinese government's government in Beijing and the provinces, and Western analysts who think that way, is the history of China in the past 30 years, since a little bit more, since the Deng Xiaoping reform. And that is that largely they have managed it. It is, without a doubt, the most remarkable and singular example of directed economic growth in the history of the world. I don't think anything is even close as to what the Chinese governments have achieved in China. So there is a very realistic basis for assuming that this transition from sort of a low-cost export model to something more developed will, will be managed by the Chinese government. One caveat to that, of course, is they've never faced a situation like this right now. Okay. The response to the financial crisis and the, and the recession, which took place at the time and then right after um, for all of the world's central banks and all the world's central governments has pretty much been the same. Once you adopt the modern, I'm not even going to say Western, because there are many permutations of it, but the modern financial system, central banks, government planning, we do government planning here too, although we pretend we don't, the avenues of action and reaction become much narrower. So pretty much every central bank in the world and the government adopts the same way of dealing with it. They're all Keynesians. One reason Keynes is so popular in governments is because he provides his theories and his ideas provided a theoretical basis for what governments would be naturally inclined to do anyway, at least in the modern world, where the demands for action to cure or to help macroeconomic problems are incessant, incessant, and certainly for democracies, but also for authoritarian governments like China, 
must be answered. So all of the governments, of course, were Keynesians. What do we do? We spend money. We pump up demand. We assume it's a cyclical problem, and we treat it by, as Paul Krugman has said a zillion times in the past five years, the problem is the output gap. Meaning society and, and uh, bis, uh, the economy can produce more goods than are demanded. So how do you handle that? You bump up demand. That's what everyone has done. Now, it's been done in different ways. But all of the central banks, the least actually has been the ECB, um, and that is probably due to Germany's sort of cultural memory of the 1920s and their uh, cultural horror of debt and inflation. But it's not true everywhere else. So it's not true in the United States. In the United States, the Fed has created vast amounts. And the reason I have this chart up, I'm going to, we're going right to this chart right here about the difference in the way that the U.S. and China have dealt with this particular problem. Shall we call it the output gap, for lack of a better term? In the United States, what the Fed has done, it's created all this liquidity. Buying various assets and putting the money out into the system. But the assets bought do not create productive or non-productive investment because they enter into the financial system, but they don't, by and large, leave the financial system. So we have not, in the United States, had a housing boom, meaning a construction boom, the past several years. We have not had a factory boom, meaning the building of new production facilities. Because although the Fed can create money, it cannot enforce and direct its use. So the money just sits there. <coughs> Excuse me. In its one effect, and the way the Fed attempts to do this, or the way the Fed theorized that it would help, is through the wealth effect, where it bumps up the stock market and other markets. And we have seen this. I don't put up a chart of the Dow because that's what we all know very well. So the, the, the Fed's best anticipation for how its monetary policies work is indirect. The Fed creates liquidity. Banks may or may not lend it out. They're probably not. Why would a bank be eager to take on a 30-year mortgage at 4% or 3.5% knowing that it's going to become increasingly difficult to fund that mortgage as time goes on because rates are bound to go up at some point? So what would be the real advantage and the real incentive for banks to lend out at historically low rates? Probably isn't any. Um, it does, however, pump up the stock market and the other trading markets. How much wealth effect is there back into the economy? It's always been my opinion that it's minimal. Yes, it's true that a vast majority of Americans have some stake in the stock market, but most of it's relatively small, and it's through retirement accounts, 401K, stuff like that. It's not the type of wealth that is readily accessible to the consumer. The small percentage of the American population that does benefit directly from an increase in stock market is one, probably more financially sophisticated, 
less likely to go out and spend what could very easily disappear. So the wealth effect has always been minimal. What's the difference in China? The difference in China, now remember, all the central banks of the world deal with this stuff in the same way. They all created money. They all tried to pump up and close the, the demand gap, or the output gap, excuse me. But in China, the way that it takes place is very different. The mandarins, and I think it's perfectly acceptable to call the Chinese Communist Party officials who run the government and the economy in China mandarins, as the old imperial bureaucrats were called. I don't know if the Chinese current civil service is as rigorous and demanding and probably also as stultifying and as hidebound as the old imperial bureaucracy became. Remember, China's historical method of renewing its government is overthrowing the, the ruling dynasty. The mandate of heaven, as they called it, has been removed. And you get a new dynasty. The current dynasty in China is how many years old? 1948. So that's 64 years? No. 54 years. That would be 98. 64 years. Anybody got a calculator handy? All of our math skills have deteriorated. I think my kids are probably better at a different than I am. That is not a long time in the history of Chinese dynasties. So putting Chinese, the current Chinese government in historical context is something which is quite sobering to do and sobering for them to do as well. In China, the method that the government and the central bank, but they're really the same thing, have used to foster demand, to foster employment to keep the economy growing has been to not create liquidity and fling it out into the market hoping that it will do something but to direct loan demand out into the economy but if you are a Chinese construction company or a Chinese development company, and you're the recipient of a loan from a bank, you don't sit on it, and you don't put it into treasury bills. You go out and build something. You build housing. You build apartments. You build factories. You build office complexes. The method that China uses, because it's finan one reason is because its financial market is so much less developed than the United States, is to build something. So here we are looking at all China. Let's look at this one: all system Chinese financing. Now, a lot of there is a certain cyclical nature to financing in China. And you, and you can see it because you get peaks at similar times. Look at this. You had a March peak here. You had a March peak here. And a March peak here at, at, at similar times. But the distribution is you don't get an accurate picture of it by because this is based on when the loan, you know, the demand as a monthly function, as is when the loans are created and, and um, dispersed. But a loan peak like this or this, what it does is it then creates the money, which then continues to work throughout the economy, the loan, for the next six or eight months or a year as the projects are built. So this is like boosting the thermometer in your home up to 80 for an hour, knowing that that will keep the home warm for the next three or four hours. It's a similar concept here. The Chinese 
government orders these loans. They get distributed out through the system. And then the loan money is spent for the next six months or a year warming the economy. That's what you see in this distribution. The problem for China and for any country that, that governs development this way is that if there is no productive use for the factories, if nobody moves in and starts buying or paying rent on the homes that are built, then how do you sustain the economy? How do you sustain the growth if many of the facilities that you have built are non-productive? And that is the question overall, specifically in general, for the Chinese economy. And the uh, rulers of the Chinese economy in Beijing. Okay, so this is the loan demand. And you can see March, early in the year, there's a loan peak. Early in the year, there's a loan peak. Early in the year, there's a loan peak. Again and again and again. There is no, and these are official Chinese statistics, I mean, there, there's no mystery into what's going on here. Okay, let's take a look at another chart here. That was loan demand. Let's try another one here. I, I, first I'm going to establish it, and then we will look at some of the additional factors or secondary statistics, shall we say, that give a sense of what's going on. Okay, here's another one. We're going to establish what the Chinese are doing. Here we go again. Look at the peak this year. In China, and I have the actual, um, you know, I don't have the statistics for this. I just have the, uh, the graphs. I think the graphs uh, work much better than looking at a table. Again, same thing. Now, this is new, uh, monthly new, new loans, um, new yuan loans in, in local currency. So this is the money that the Chinese government is ordering out of the economy. It's not, however, the entire picture. Because this comes from, I'm pretty sure, this comes from the banking system. There's another entire system out there that you know, they now call the shadow banking system, just like we call it the same thing here, um, that creates another whole category and group of loans. So there is far more money flooding out into the Chinese economy created by the Chinese government, or at least by its banks, as depicted on this chart. Now, two things are interesting about this chart. One is this peak here. Now, remember, we got a new Chinese government recently. And the Li Kuang, I think. Uh, Kiang, I believe, is the name, but if anyone knows better, they can correct me on that. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. My, uh, my brief bout with studying Chinese did not last very long. Well, it was a terribly productive, I'm afraid. Um, I took Chinese in graduate school and soon realized that it would take me more than the two years that I had to learn Chinese, so I fell back on my French. This is not a chart that, in any sense, is a reflection of loan demand. <coughs> it is a chart of what the Chinese government has ordered. And that, it, even more than, it's, I guess it's both, both positive and negative for the Chinese economy, if you look at it this way. If this were a graph of loan demand, not controlled by the government, that this would be incredibly worrying. Although, as you can see, it's happened many times before. But this would mean that the demand has suddenly fallen out of bed, that nobody wants any loans anymore. But in fact, that's not what this is. This is what the Chinese government I'll, I'll see if I can deal with that. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but give me a second. Let me finish this one chart, and then I'll talk about that. 
I'll answer some of the questions. And we'll look at, I have some charts on those, actually. This is a chart of what the Chinese government has ordered. This means that the government in China, the government in Beijing, is attempting to rein in, and everyone has seen this, the excessive loan production, which is causing all sorts of distortions in the economy, non-productive distortions. I don't think there's any question on two points. One, or like I say, three points. One, that the Chinese, over the past five years, have kept their economy humming. Because after all, if the world is not buying their goods, then who is? It's certainly not the Chinese. So all these factories and everything else that have been built... What are they doing? And do you just keep building them? You build another building that nobody's in, and another building, and another building, and another building forever? Does this work? No, of course not. And the Chinese have, over the past five years, since the the financial crash, used this type of economic growth to keep their economy running, to keep people employed, to keep the change of dynasty away. Okay, let me, let me look at this question here. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, the, the, ch- the euro and the one... Well, if a, if a country pegs its, its currency to another... Um, and they have a, 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 an open system, then what happens is the, the central bank has to come in and if there's pressure on the currency, the central bank has to come in and buy it and sell whatever's being traded against it to maintain the peg. Now, there are other ways to do that. China does not, in fact, have an open system. The only place you can deal with yuan is through Chinese banks, and so they can simply control what they're going to do. There is no outside trading in China. But if you have a open system, then which the Europeans had, remember, many of us probably remember the European raid mechanism back in the late 90s that fell apart. Um, central banks have a very difficult time. Actually, it's impossible, certainly for an individual central bank, um, except maybe the United States, which has unlimited resources because of the dollar reserve status, to intervene in the market successfully to maintain a peg. Um, When the market pressures the peg, the peg almost always falls because the resources of the international currency markets are far greater than the resources of any central bank. This is the George Soros story from... The 90s, um, when the, uh, the British pound was pegged to a certain level within the ERM, and it simply couldn't work. And so that's how. Now, again, China does not have to do this because their, their currency is not fully traded. And my guess is if the Chinese currency, let's take a look at the Chinese uh, yuan. Let's take a five-year yuan right here. Where's my five-year yuan rate? Okay, this is the five-year yuan rate. If you go back further, you see another another rise in the yuan rate. Oops, I don't know what that's doing there. Um, And then as the financial crisis hit, they stopped the appreciation. If it was a freely traded currency, you would have a much steeper increase because the market would have, as markets always do, they overshoot, they pressure. Everyone would have piled on, and you would have had a much steeper appreciation of the Chinese yuan of this period. You didn't have it because the Chinese simply didn't permit it. You can't trade in the yuan outside of China, so you can't. there's nothing you can do. Um, and any market outside of China references this rate, so it's controlled as well, because it's not a real rate if it's not referencing the Chinese market. Okay. 
Um, I'll, I'll deal with that in a second. It is possible, but I doubt it very much. Um, it wouldn't be in the advantage, I think, of China. If you look at the yuan, here's a one-year rate. And this, of course, is the most interesting chart. So, but before we deal with this, let's get back, back to our topic so we, we go through it systematically, which is a little bit hard to do, but let's fall. So we now saw what the Chinese government is doing to prop up their economy. And here you have the Chinese uh, quarterly GDP. Up at 12% back there, and now down around 7 It's long. We used to be said about a year and a half or two years ago, or maybe a little bit more, that China needed to maintain an 8% rate of growth to keep the, uh, the unrest at bay. That clearly is not the case, but it's close. So the Chinese government wants to keep the GDP somewhere around 7.5%. There's little doubt in my mind that the official statistics will reflect that. And this is the heart of what we're dealing with. The Reporting system in China is a top-down system. So everyone knows what the goals are. So the statisticians, the government officials that report back to the Chinese government, have a great incentive to meet their goals. You might say it's a legacy of the five-year plans, so overproduction, all of the other uh, attributes, reporting attributes, motivational attributes of a centralized government, a centralized economic planning government. So the Chinese have maintained their official GDP. Not surprising. Okay? Now, let's take a look at some of the other figures that are less than, let's not put it that way that um, give you another view of the Chinese. This is the Chinese money supply. This, of course, follows the loan figures very closely. Something, and we know what it is, has gone on. The Chinese government has decided to try and rein in what's going on with the, with the production, with, with loans producing in the uh, producing non-productive assets in the economy because you can't do much else with it. Otherwise, it will eventually get out of control and blow up. Easier to do now. So let's look at Chinese exports. That, that 18% fall, we're not far from the levels of 2008 and 2009. That does not look like a 7.5% growth rate. Does it? The Chinese economy is largely export driven. I don't know exactly what the what the rate what, if I remember the figures around seventy percent, like quite like the reverse of what you have in the United States. I'm not one hundred percent sure about that. This is a one month fall. This would seem to belie the possibility of a soft landing in China and something managed. However, the arguments also mean, well, the Chinese government is trying for years to foster domestic consumption. This is a domestic consumption chart. This is retail sales. It's evident that wherever the exports are not going, they have not been replaced by domestic consumption. So Chinese industries have not stopped shipping things to San Francisco and started shipping things to Shan or to Kanta or not Kanta, Guangzhou or Kumin. So it's not been replaced by domestic consumption. Another figure. This one is often used by, and I'm going to take a look at Yuan in a minute. These are two of these are the official PMI statistics, purchasing manager indexes. Officially, look what it's been doing for almost a year. 
It's just tootling along above 50%. Now, these are the official statistics. There is a secondary set of statistics, well, secondary producers, I said by Hong Kong, Shanghai, and they are considerably lower. This is manufacturing PMI. It's at 50.2 in the last month. The Shanghai, I mean, the Hong Kong Shanghai manufacturing PMI is 48 and a half in February, and it's down from 45 and a half. It's in contraction and has been, I believe, for five or six months. Let's take a look at services. This is the official services. Up to 55 in the latest reporting month. Hong Kong, Shanghai, 51 in February, up from 50.7. Now, China's economy is dominated by manufacturing. So it is this which matters. And in fact, since about here, it has been running under 50%. Chinese manufacturing is actually compacted and has been for at least half a year. Another one. Probably heard a lot about this one. Uh, we did the exports. This is copper. Copper is a basic industrial commodity. And it has been demand from China and Chinese manufacturing, electronics, all sorts of other stuff that has driven the price. This decline looks a lot like, where's the China loans? Sorry. Looks a lot like this, doesn't it? The new yuan loans or the aggregate financing. So again, we have another statistic which does not look like the steady state 7.5 GDP that we're seeing from the Chinese statistics for 2012 and 2013, heading into 2014. And what you're likely to get when the statistics are reported, I actually don't know when the, when the first quarter of 14 is reported, probably some, uh, sometime in April, but I'm not sure what. Um, chances are you're going to get another 7.5, 7, 6, 7, 7, something like that. But that statistic does not look like any of the other secondary things. Look at another one that's used often. This is well, used in industrial production. This fall must or should be mirrored in the GDP numbers. You know, every economy seems to have an emblematic number. In the United States, for the past five years, it has been, we all know, non-farm payrolls. And maybe uh, followed by GDP, but primarily non-farm payrolls. The one that everybody looks at. Everybody talks about gets written up way too much, is not nearly as important as everyone says, but it becomes the emblem, the symbol of the success or failure of the economy. For China, it is without a doubt GDP. It's the one that colors the emotional view of China. And so for the Chinese government, which is, of course, in control of the economy, to control the figures, and whose bureaucrats have every motivation to deliver what is required, the GDP number is not terribly reliable. If we get another 7.7%, 7, 7.5% 7, in the first quarter, which we probably will, then you have to look at this and say, what? Where did that come from? Let's try another one. Electricity. I read this frightening piece by Glenn Harlan Reynolds. I think he's a professor in 
University of Tennessee. I'm not sure where he, where he teaches, actually. And he's talking about EMPs in the United States. That's uh, electric. What does EMP stand for? Electromagnetic pulse weapon. It is a type of nuclear device that uh, device, and I wonder, a nuclear bomb um, exploded in the atmosphere um, is specifically configured to send out a huge pulse of electromagnetic radiation that basically fries all electric systems, power generation systems, cars. Nothing works. If you want to deliver an apocalypse quicker than anything else, that's the way to do it. This is electricity use. Everything in our world runs off the power grid. Everything. There's no food in the stores if the trucks can't get fuel and can't start. It goes on and on and on. Electricity is the definition of modern culture. Period. One does not want to think about the consequences of a nationwide here or anywhere else long-term loss of electric power. Therefore, electricity is the sine qua non, without which nothing, Latin, of modern industrial economies. And this is a chart of Chinese industrial usage. And again, it has fallen out of bed. Not that it hasn't other times, but it has fallen out of bed in the first quarter. So we're again looking at a secondary statistic that does not at all look as happy or even as status quo as the statistic for GDP. Now, you look at these things and you have to be predicting that something is going to give, but something isn't necessarily going to give because the Chinese statistics will still be reported. The emotional statistic of the GDP will most likely still be reported as achieving the Chinese government's goals. Um, as far as pegging the, uh, the, the, the yuan to gold, uh, I don't think so. Um, there are two reasons. One, that would take away the enorm that would take away the Chinese government's control. And two, why trust them? Meaning, how do you know how much gold they actually have? So I don't think we're going to see that. The Chinese are far more, have far better um, functionality in their economy by their uh, controlling their currencies, which is what they do. Okay, so let's look at one more thing, a few more things here, and then we will. Uh, Oops, come on, mouse. Okay, here we go. This is the Shanghai Exchange um, over the past year, down but not terribly. This is the five-year. Oh, a different story entirely. Think about how different this chart is to Western exchanges. Remember, Chinese loans go to create factories and harbing and houses outside of Guangdong, and a lot of air pollution, apparently, too. It does not go to support the stock market. Because this is the same period, you have to turn this chart 45 degrees up to make it look like the Dow, or the NASDAQ, or the S&P 500, or the FTSE, or the DAX, or the CAC 40, whatever it is. The type of development in China is very different. It does not go to supporting financial assets. The development of productive facilities in the United States and in Europe is decided by individuals who decide that they want to, or companies, but individuals, basically, somebody makes a decision. 
decide that they want to expand their tire factory, and they go out and buy the land, and they build a factory. They do that because they expect to make money doing it. That decision, by and large, has not been made on an economy-wide basis in the United States or in the West or in, or in Japan. Because it's individual and not directed, it doesn't get done because the economic situation does not demand it. It's not true in China. So the money in China goes out into the fields, if you will, to build a new tractor plant. In the United States, it goes into the stock market. Okay. Now, let me look at the... Specifically at the currencies here. And I, there's an interesting... First, I'm going to look at the yuan. Okay, this is the... And this is the, this is the last thing we'll do here. Um, okay, we've probably got about three or four more minutes here. Um, this is the yuan. This is 60-minute um, yuan chart going back to February. You can see the yuan has been depreciated by the Chinese government. Let's take another look at it. This is the five-year. Steady appreciation. What does this do? Well, it helps keep down inflation in China. What else does it do? It tends to draw in tremendous amounts of money to China. What part of that they want? Investment. But it also draws money in because you can't speculate in the yuan. At least not the way we're used to speculating in the currency. You open up a position, you see where it goes, and you reach. can't do that. I mean, you can, but the return is much smaller um, because the market is controlled. But what you can do is you buy a factory in China, and then in three or four years, when you sell it or when you get out of your investment, the yuan is going to be 50% stronger or 30% stronger. That's the way you speculate in Chinese yuan by direct investment, if they call FDI, foreign direct investment. That's not what we do. If we want to speculate in the euro, we don't go out and buy part of a Renault factory in France. We take a long euro position. We see where it goes. Very different. So in addition to Chinese loans demanded by the government creating plants, there's all sorts of Western money or foreign money, shall we say, flowing into the country and being distributed out into various products. So the actual creation of, of, of money and loans supporting the Chinese economy is actually far greater than what's depicted in official statistics. Okay, now let's see what kind of response you have. Now, the Chinese over the past, let's take a look. Here's the one year. Ho, oh, ho, look at this. That's as steep a depreciation as the yuan as you would see in any freely traded currency. Pretty cool, if you knew it was coming. That's the kind of thing, you know, you can see if the Fed went out and started raising rates tomorrow, that's what you'd see in the, you'd see in the dollar. So, as with the prior... Um, Depreci appreciation of the yuan over the past five years, this is government ordained. So is this. Okay, so is that. Now, what effect does this have? Now, China is the big boy on the block in Asia and the second largest economy in the world. So what effect does this have? This is, you know, when you, when you start manipulating your currency rates, it's a version of beggar thy neighbor. Well, if my rates are lower, I'm going to sell more goods. What does this look like? This looks like a very, and it's, you know, it, it, people see it, but they don't really pay a lot of attention to it. This is the reverse of this chart here. You can take any one of these charts. This one, the fall in exports. Uh, let's find another one. Where am I? This one, the fall in yuan loans. This one, aggregate financing. 
or even this one, industrial production, or this one, uh, um, China Electric. Any of those charts are the opposite of this one. And there's no, absolutely no mystery about this. One rate is determined by the PBOC. The PBOC knows, as does everyone in Beijing, at least in the government, that China is an export-driven nation. The economy is exports. So what is this? This is the answer. This is one of the answers to the export problem, to the economic problem. Reduce the currencies. Reduce loans. Stop building productive facilities that aren't going anywhere, that aren't productive. Stop building homes. But you still need to keep the people employed. And how do you do that? with this type of currency manipulation. Now, it's not going to be the answer, but as with everything in an economy, it is part of the answer. And so this is what you're seeing as China attempts to rein in the sort of empty development that it has indulged in in the past five years. You know, you can make an argument, and I would, and I'm about to, and I'll wrap up in a second. And it's just occurred to me that, in a way, the Fed support of the economy has probably far less, we'll see how this plays out, far less um, long-term damaging effects than what China's done. Because the effect of the Fed and its loose money policy have been largely limited to the markets. Maybe it's, maybe it's boosted housing somewhat, but not very much. But the rest of it hasn't really done very much. Nobody has built a tire plant someplace that can't sell its tires because there's no demand. But in China, that has happened. The entire economy in China has been affected by the type of development that has been sponsored by the Chinese government. Okay, folks, so there's a lot to yet see on this. Now, remember, before we get carried away, um, a few people have been for predicting the imminent collapse of the Chinese economy for about four years now. It hasn't happened yet. I don't anticipate that it will. I think that there is a great deal of competence and motivation in Beijing, and although I do think that you're going to get a much steeper contraction in China in the next year than certainly the government anticipates. How it's reported, though, is a different question. Okay, folks, uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope this was instructive. We will look at China again in a few months and see where we are um, and see where my predictions have taken us. Again, thank you all very much. I will put my email up there. If anyone has any questions, uh, any comments, criticisms, please send me an email and I'll be glad to respond. Thank you all for, for attending. I do appreciate everyone's attention. Take care.